just sit down. I'm Valerie Pringle, and this is Thinking Positive, which is a web series marking the 25th anniversary of the Canadian Foundation for AIDS Research. And I'm delighted to be sitting across from Stephen Lewis, who knows more about this pandemic than most people. I mean, talk is now of an AIDS-free generation. Is that way overly optimistic? It's realistic in the sense that all of the science is there. We know how to confound the virus. It's probably unrealistic in terms of time. There is still so much to do. There is so much left out. There are so many people infected. There are so many high-risk groups who need attention that it's going to take quite a while to get to the AIDS-free generation. And I think for the first time, what we gave in 2011 over 2010 was absolutely flatlined. The bulk of the money now comes from within the developing country budgets themselves, which no one thought was likely even three or four years ago. We talk about ending pediatric AIDS, but there are still 300,000 kids being born HIV positive every year. And frankly, we pay almost no attention to the mothers whatsoever. We've just recently discovered that women are as important as the infants they bear. The fact that there are over 3 million kids who are living with the virus between the ages of 6 and 15 and have no treatment whatsoever at the moment, that's an appalling truth. And there are over 30 million people who require treatment of whom about 8 million are getting it. So it's a huge cost. It's a determined, methodical focus, which is still lacking. And then everybody suddenly discovered that in parts of the world where the transmission isn't heterosexual, as it is in Africa, where it's men who have sex with men, or injecting drug users, or sex workers, or prison populations, particularly in South Asia, Eastern Europe, Central Asia, Russia, the pandemic is exploding. It's going up, not down, and that's a real worry. Where do you see solutions? Where do you see things that are actually making a difference and working? The only place I see it without being excessive is on the ground. It's at community level. That's where the discrimination and stigma is overcome when people have this intense solidarity and generosity of spirit and community health workers look after others in the community and they all shore each other up and gradually the stigma declines and a woman who finds herself infected can come home and disclose to her husband or partner who probably infected her without feeling that she'll be beaten up or thrown out of the house or lose all her children. I mean, these are commonplace features which occurred in the last decade and are gradually diminishing. But the stigma is awful. The stigma is unbelievable everywhere in the world. Everywhere. It's the most powerful and debilitating force. Even in the West. Oh, God, yes. Oh, God, yes. The, 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 the fact that African-American men in the United States, who are now the single greatest rise in infection levels in the United States, or African-American women, they can never disclose they're under horrendous community harshness. Uh, and I see it all the time in Africa. I see it all the time. I was in Russia not that long ago speaking on injecting drug use, and all around me were surly faces of anger to think that a drug users should have the right to live. I mean, it was just a, it's, it's the intensity of something that is sexually transmitted or transmitted in a way which does not receive universal approval. And it's heartbreaking because the, the pain that is suffered by wonderful people who happen to be infected. It, it's amazing that you can still be saying these things, you know, 25 know. years later. I mean, I know. It's and I think a lot of people in Canada would still be surprised. They'd think, oh, no, we've, we've beaten that. You know, didn't Princess Diana shake a hand? We thought we got rid of stigma. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating, isn't it? And it's also so true in Canada around the Aboriginal populations, so true in the downside, downtown east side of Vancouver. Wherever you get a concentration of the evident pandemic and people can make moral judgments, those moral judgments are prejudicial. I mean, you drive people underground. They don't get treatment. They don't have prevention. They don't get care. Their sexual relationships are furtive and frantic. They take up with women because they want to prove they're heterosexual in a, in a judgmental society. Everything that goes on in so many places prejudices the individual happens to be infected through no fault of his or her own. Do you see progress? Yeah, yeah, I see, I see considerable progress in treatment. 
and I see considerable progress in awareness. And I recognize that people have understood that male circumcision is an important intervention and that ending vertical transmission from mother to child during the birthing process is an important intervention. So I, uh, I, I see a lot of progress, but I still see huge obstacles. The single greatest obstacle being the treatment of women, the approach to women, the second greatest obstacle being stigma. The virus is hard enough to fight. And you're still fighting this whack-a-mole game, not to make light of it in any way, on every front still. Yes, yes, and, and I, I can't get over it. You're quite right to, to say it's implausible. How can it be 25 or 30 years later that you're still doing this? And I, I watch the grandmothers in Africa as they try to deal with their community that think that somehow, because they've had to bury their adult children, they are criminal. Uh, they haven't protected them from sexual contact. You see the little orphan kids who are mocked, derided. They chant nasty things as the kids go to school. Teachers can abuse them with impunity because they come from an AIDS-related family. I mean, it's, <laughs> you want to believe <laughs> that the human spirit is inherently decent. And dealing with this virus makes you wonder about the antagonisms that rest in the soul. Why do you still do this, Stephen? I mean, we know you've... you've... <sighs> My family says I'm hopelessly neurotic without a cause. <laughs> they can't stand to put up with me on a day-to-day -day basis. So this is a cause. But why this cause? Well, actually, there is a real, there's a real basis for it. At the end of the 90s, I was working as the deputy at UNICEF, responsible for international programming. And every time we thought we were making progress in Africa around, for example, immunization of kids, we found we were falling behind because more kids were dying than were living. And we didn't understand it at first until we suddenly realized it was the virus, that AIDS was complicating everything. And, and not only complicating, but sabotaging everything. So it was at that point around the year 2000 that I said to myself, I want to be a part of ending this damn thing. I want to, I want to devote some years of life to it. And, and, and you get completely caught up because you're dealing with lovely, lovely human beings at community level whose, whose struggles are so heroic. They are so resilient. They're so brave. When they die, it's such a loss. It's so excruciating. And, and you just want to make sure that it ends somehow. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm 75 years old. I don't have that many more years to go. I resent that, by the way. But I don't have that many more years to go in this fight. But I want to see it end before I move to some other planet. So you've got a few more years to fight. Oh, by God, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Stephen. Not at all.